Welcome, everyone. Welcome. Thank you so much for joining Limud FSU online session with Ambassador Stuart Eisenstadt. My name is Natasha Chechik. I'm the Director of Public Affairs at Limud FSU. So just before we begin with the session, if you have questions, so you will have some okay. questions to the Ambassador Eisenstadt, please don't hesitate. Just write your questions in the chat, in the chat box, and we will do our best to answer your questions if we have a few spare minutes in the end. So let's begin our session. It's my pleasure to introduce you to Limud FSU founder, Mr. Heim Chesler, who also initiated this whole event. Mr. Chesler, please. Thank you. First of all, before I introduce our chairman of Limud FSU, uh, International Student Committee, I just want to say that Deborah Lipson will be the coordinator. She is English born author and journalist, and she will be coordinating the meeting. And of course, our uh, host is Matthew Brofman, the Limud FSU chairman of the International Steering Committee. By the way, he's serving now since the foundation over 15 years ago. And also, he is serving as the chairman of the board of trustees of AJC. And also is the chairman and CEO of BHB Holding, who is holding including IKEA Israel and a large and growing affordable housing portfolio of properties in the United States. Without further ado, please, Matthew Brofman. Thank you, Haim. Thank you, everybody. And of course, a special thank you to you, Ambassador Eisenstadt. Uh, for those of you who, who don't know, Ambassador Eisenstadt's resume is longer than my arm, so I will try to give you just some brief highlights before turning the session over to him. So during the decade and a half of public service in three U.S. administrations, Ambassador Eisenstadt has held a number of senior positions, including Chief White House Domestic Policy Advisor to President Jimmy Carter, uh, the U.S. Ambassador to the European Union, Undersecretary of Commerce for International Trade, Undersecretary of State for Economic, Business, and Agricultural Affairs, and Deputy Secretary of the Treasury in the Clinton administration, where the ambassador worked very closely with my dad, uh, Edgar Bronfman, when he was president of the World Jewish Congress. I want to especially focus on one area of his resume because it ties into today's session. Much of the interest in providing belated justice for victims of the Holocaust and other victims of Nazi tyranny during World War II was a result of his leadership in the Clinton administration as special representative of the president and secretary of state on Holocaust era issues. Ambassador Eisenstadt successfully negotiated major agreements with the Swiss, Germans, Austrian, and French, and other European countries covering restitution of property, payment for slave and forced laborers, recovery of looted art bank accounts, and payment of insurance policies. And he wrote a book on most of these events called Imperfect Justice, Looted Assets, Slave Labor, and the Unfinished Business of World War II. The book has been translated into many, many languages. Ambassador Eisenstadt has received eight honorary doctorate degrees from universities and academic institutions, and the list goes on and on. Ladies and gentlemen, we are truly, truly grateful to Ambassador Eisenstadt for taking an hour out of his day to share uh, his thoughts with us on, on this very, very important topic. And we're very grateful to have you here today, too. So with that, I turn the mic over to you and say thank you again. Thank you, Chaim, thank you for Thank creating this wonderful organization. Uh, Natasha, thank you for all the work you've done organizing the session and to my dear friend, Matthew Bronfman. Uh, I am especially appreciative to discuss the topic of what's been done and what remains to be done in our historic effort to try to bring some measure of justice for the victims of the Shoah. Uh, much has been accomplished but much remains to be done. Matthew, of course, is the son of the revered Edgar Bronfman, who was president of the World Jewish Congress, and as Matthew alluded to, was a major figure in activating the Clinton administration and the U.S. government to the effort that I ended up leading. More on that in a minute. The Holocaust was, of course, the most ghastly genocide in human history with the wanton murder of six million Jews, including one and a half million children. That was two thirds of the total 
number of European Jews at the time, and a third of world Jewry at the time. To put it in perspective, in 1939, in a world of 2 billion people, there were before the war 17 million Jews. Today, in a world of 7 billion people, there are 14.8 million Jews. We've never been able to come back to our pre-Holocaust numbers. But the Shoah was also the greatest theft in world history. As the Nazis confiscated literally tens of billions of dollars of Jewish businesses, homes, and personal effects, artworks, cultural and religious objects, photographs, musical instruments, not just importantly for the enrichment of the Third Reich, but as a way of totally wiping out all vestiges of Jewish religion and culture. For artwork alone, they stole a staggering 600,000 pieces of art. I've led an effort now over decades, both in the Clinton administration and in the Obama administration, and now continuing into uh, the Trump administration. And separately, as the head of the negotiating team of the Jewish Claims Conference, to recover over $17 billion in compensation. There was nothing inevitable about the Holocaust. Hitler proceeded carefully and methodically at each step to gauge world reaction to the anti-Jewish laws he proposed in the 30s. And then when he took, he took further action when he saw no consequences. My involvement for Holocaust survivors and restitution comes directly from a really historic meeting that Edgar Bronfman had with President and Mrs. Clinton. The Cold War had recently ended, and he urged them to appoint someone to lead the effort initially to restore communal property, synagogues and schools, day, uh, cemeteries, all to surviving, although tiny, Jewish communities in Central and Eastern Europe so they could rebuild their shattered communities. I called them the double victims of both Nazism and then communism. And it was that which led the president to get me directly engaged at a time I was US ambassador to the European Union and all of my staff told me I shouldn't take the job. I had a full-time job as ambassador to the EU. Why did I do it? In 1968, I was a senior official as a young age in the presidential campaign of Hubert Humphrey against Richard Nixon. And I met a man named Arthur Morse, who was twice my age at the time, and had just published a book called While Six Million Died, which for the first time laid out what the Roosevelt administration knew about the Jews uh, in Europe and the genocide and failed to act on. And I was shocked because FDR was an icon to American Jews. And I pledged to myself then as a 25 year old, if I was ever in a senior position in government, I wanted to do something to rectify this. My first opportunity actually came during the Carter administration when my recommendation to the president to create a presidential commission on the Holocaust headed by Elie Wiesel led directly to the US Holocaust Memorial Museum. Today, almost 50 million visitors have come to that museum, three quarters of whom are non-Jewish. Now, to fast forward to the Clinton administration, as I mentioned, because of Edgar's direct intervention with President and Mrs. Clinton, they asked me to get involved. And when my staff in Brussels said, no, you can't do it, I remembered my pledge to myself that if I ever had the chance, I was gonna rectify this dark cloud over the US involvement with respect to the genocide, having been so brave through our soldiers to win the war on the ground. And I took the lead 
in negotiating $8 billion in recoveries. And I took that job, Matthew, as special advisor to the president of Holocaust issues to every position, ambassador of the European Union, under Secretary of Commerce, under Secretary of State, Deputy Treasury Secretary. And here's what we accomplished. In 1998, we got one and a quarter billion dollars from Swiss banks who had hidden bank accounts, and this is where your dad was absolutely seminal, they had hidden bank accounts deposited with them to people trying to escape from the clutches of Nazism and put their assets in the safest institution in neutral Switzerland that they could. And then after the war, if they survived or if they didn't, their relatives came to collect their bank accounts and the Swiss bank said, we don't have any record of bank accounts. We don't know what you're talking about. Well, we found out, in fact, that they did. There were 54,000 possible and 21,000 certain bank accounts. And we reached a settlement with the great intervention of Judge Edward Corman in, in New York of one and a quarter billion dollars. We then went to solve the slave labor problem in Germany and Austria. Class action lawsuit lawyers who had sued the Swiss banks then sued the German slave and forced labor companies, German insurance companies, and Austrian insurance and slave labor companies. And with my mediation in July of 2000, in a direct agreement with the German government and the German private sector, over 6,000 German private companies, we reached a 10 billion Deutschmark, $5 billion agreement to compensate for the first time slave and forced labor both Jews and non-Jews, and to pay some $350 million in insurance policies, which had never been paid. Why weren't they paid? Because the insurance companies said the owners didn't pay their premiums when they were in Auschwitz. The German agreement also included the creation of a foundation called Remembrance, Responsibility, and the Future for future education programs, and that still exists. In the Austria agreement, it included $150 million for movable property, jewelry, businesses, apartment leases as well, $400 million for slave and forced labor, and then $210 million for a real property uh, process, which was brilliantly run by the Austrians and paid over 18,000 people for their lost real property. At the very tail end of the Clinton administration, in January of 2001, just after we concluded the Austrian agreement, we concluded an agreement with French banks for $22 million for the same perfidy that the, French, the Swiss banks had done. And in 1998, I negotiated something called the Washington Principles on Nazi Confiscated Art with 44 countries and established principles for the restitution and compensation of Nazi looted art. And interestingly, although not legally binding, it's had a profound impact on the art world. It's led to the recovery of tens of thousands of looted artworks from museums in the US and throughout Europe. The establishment of claims tribunals in the UK, France, Netherlands, Austria, and Germany, and special staffs at Christie's and Sotheby's to identify Nazi looted art. In the Obama administration, as special advisor on Holocaust issues to secretaries of state, Hillary Clinton and John Kerry, I negotiated the 2009 Theresen Declaration with 46 countries to encourage the return of looted Jewish assets and greater social services for poor elderly survivors. The 2010 best practices and guidelines for restituting real property confiscated by the Nazis. In 2011, a uh, $13 million agreement with Lithuania for payment over 10 years in lieu of property restitution and one-time payments for individuals. And then in late 2014, a $60 million agreement with the French government, which has just been concluded now with the last payouts for their deportation of Jews on the French railway, SNCF, to concentration camps outside of France. But I was determined, Chaim and Matthew and 
my, my colleagues, that the last word for the Holocaust should not be simply compensation. It should also be education, coming to terms with the lessons of the Holocaust so that they are understood and applied. And that's why going back to the Carter administration in 1978, I wrote that memorandum leading to the creation of the Holocaust Museum. In 1997, as part of the education process, I led a 13 agency review of the role of Switzerland during World War II, and particularly the role of G Swiss Central Bank in accepting Nazi looted gold bullion, which they knew had come not from the Swiss, uh, from the German Central Bank's reservoir, but from the gold bullion that the Nazis looted from the countries they occupied. The next year, we did a study on other neutrals, Spain, Portugal, and Turkey. What was their role? And this helped catalyze countries from Switzerland to Lithuania and dozens of others to establish their own historical commissions to examine their role during World War II. As part of this, in July 1995, French President Jacques Chirac, for the first time, imagine this now, we're talking about 40 years way after the war. The war ended in 45. This is 95, 50 years later. For the first time, on behalf of the French people and the French government, he assumed responsibility for Vichy's collaboration with the Nazis and the mistreatment and deportation of Jews from France. In December 1999, as part of our German slave labor agreement, in his official residence in Berlin, German President Rao said, with my being present, I beg forgiveness on behalf of the German people for the Nazi mistreatment of slave and forced labor. And then as part of this education process, continuing today, and I'll get to this more in a minute, in January of 2000 in Stockholm, taking the lead of Swedish Prime Minister Goran Persson, we created the Holocaust Education Task Force, then with only a half dozen countries, to promote Holocaust education in the school systems. Today, that has now become the International Holocaust Education Remembrance Alliance with 34 countries who are promoting Holocaust education worldwide. And let me just say, we can indict ourselves in the United States. We have a decentralized education system in our 50 states. Only 12 of the 50 states have any form of Holocaust education, even though we help create this institution. 38 have absolutely none. Now let's talk about my role with the Jewish Claims Conference. That began in 2009, but again, it's important to give you the history. It was not until seven years after the end of World War II that the first post-war German Chancellor, Konrad Adenauer, agreed in the Luxembourg Agreement with David Ben-Gurion, the Prime Minister of Israel, to make the Jewish Claims Conference based in New York and in Jerusalem. And I know Matthew knows about it because he's on the executive committee to make them the official negotiating body with Germany for compensation. Now, frankly, the beginnings were very, very modest. The German laws in the 1950s and 60s paid extremely small amounts. I'm talking about a couple of hundred million Deutschmarks to survivors. But since 1952, the German government has now paid to date, $80 billion to survivors, most from direct negotiations by the Claims Conference. From 1980 onward, the Claims Conference not only negotiated, but administered the compensation programs for those funded by Germany. But importantly for Limud and for your organization and membership, until 1990, with the fall of the Berlin Wall and the collapse of communists in Central and Eastern Europe. The programs excluded survivors in the Soviet Union and the Communist East Bloc, and they remain the poorest survivors in the world. Beginning in 2009, along with my co-chair, Roman Kent, 
in New York and an inspiring group of Holocaust survivors now living in Poland, Israel, the UK, and the US, and including Rabbi Andrew Baker of the American Jewish Committee. I've led the claims conference negotiation with the German Ministry of Finance. And I wanna tell you, to be frank, they're tough, they're lengthy, they're difficult, they're contentious. They've led to $9 billion of recovery since 2009, but these are tough negotiations. And yet, to their credit, now, 75 years later, I'm negotiating sometimes with German officials who weren't even born during the war. And yet, they still recognize their obligation to those Holocaust victims. And when we finish our negotiations, we would have had one May 12th in New York, but for the COVID crisis, it's being rescheduled to September. They have to then be passed by the German Bundestag. This is German public taxpayer money. Every negotiation we've done, every single one has unanimously been passed by every political party in the Bundestag. And they're designed to provide elderly survivors with the ability to live in dignity in their final years, having suffered so grievously in their youth. So let me briefly mention these programs, which are separate from the ones I negotiated with the U.S. government. These are the claims conference agreements with Germany. First is what we call the hardship fund. It was created in 1980 to provide one-time payments of 2,556 euros to survivors who didn't qualify for pensions, and they're mostly Russian and former Soviet Union survivors who had fled the Soviet Union in the 70s and 80s and came to the US, to Israel, or Western Europe. But the Germans refused to allow any of those payments to go to those who were still in the Soviet Union for fear that the governments would simply confiscate the money. After the fall of communism, we negotiated hardship payments to survivors still living in the FSU. And that program began in 2012. Since then, 63,000 Holocaust survivors who were living in Russia, Ukraine, Belarus, and elsewhere in the FSU have received payments. In 2013, we extended this to what we called flight victims. These were Jews who fled largely to Russia within 100 kilometers of the Eastern Front to avoid the Ansatzen group, and also those who were involved in the Leningrad siege. And then we further expanded the program in 2013 and beyond to include Jewish survivors from North Africa, Tunisia, Morocco, and Algeria. And in that same year, in 2013, where, by the way, the negotiations for the first time were at Yad Vashem, we got the German government to fund an additional one-time hardship payment to child survivors. And then most recently, and this is the most recent of our programs, to those young people who are in the kinder transport. In all, the hardship fund has paid over 520,000 Jewish Nazi victims since 1980. The second major program of the claims conference with Germany is monthly pensions. This is the only program that's income tested. And this initially, again, was only for those living in Western Europe, Israel, or the US, not those in the former Soviet Union. It gives pensions to those who were in concentration camps, ghettos, who were in hiding, or used false identity. After the collapse again of communism, we then went back to the Germans, said, okay, now it's time to include these pensions for those in Central and Eastern Europe. Germany agreed, but again, they said, we're only gonna pay them smaller pensions than we pay those in the West or Israel because the cost of living was less. We thought this was a terrible decision because they had waited all these decades and gotten nothing. 
But the Germans were obdurate. And so over the course of several years, beginning in 2007, by 2012, we equalized the payments between those in the East and those in the West. The program in the East is called the Central and Eastern European Fund. Not only did we do that, we dramatically increased the pension from a couple of hundred million euros, 200 million euros per month to today, 2020, 513 euros per person per month. Since we began the program in 1992, over 120,000 survivors received pensions. And today, because of death rates, 50,000 receive these monthly payments. And they're the difference between starvation and at least some ability to live. We also liberalized with the Germans the strict eligibility requirements. For example, they said, okay, we'll give this pension program to the people in the West and the East, but they have to be in concentration camps for 18 months. We've reduced that to zero, even one day qualifies. We've reduced the time for ghetto or false identity or hiding from 18 to three months. And again, we've dramatically doubled the amount of the pensions. The third program, and the one that's, in my opinion, sort of closest to my heart, and where we've achieved the most dramatic progress, is called home care. These provide home care workers to poor elderly survivors who help with medicines, with food, with shopping, with cooking, with socialization, and in the most severe cases, with toileting. And it keeps them out of old age homes. And believe me, in Central and Eastern Europe and in the former Soviet Union, if they have any at all, you wouldn't your, want your worst enemy to be in one of those. So keeping these survivors in their homes is tremendously important. This program only began in 2004 with a tiny budget, 6 million euros worldwide. When I took over the claims conference negotiations in 2009, the entire worldwide home care budget was only 55 million euros. We've increased that since 2009 tenfold. This year, it's 524 million euros for home care. This means increasing coverage, the number of hours now 24 seven for those most in need. And these programs are done on the ground. We get the negotiated money for the Germans and we transfer it to Jewish family and children's services in the US, to self-help, which I know Matthew, you know about in New York City, to special agencies in Brooklyn where the largest survivor and poor population exists, including tens of thousands of survivors from the FSU. For those still in the former Soviet Union and Central and Eastern Europe, that money goes through the Chesed program of the Joint Distribution Committee. It's 45% of the total budget of JDC, and in Israel through a special agency. Since 2009, we've received over 3 billion euros from the German government for home care. I'm also pleased that for Governor Pataki, the governor several years ago, established the Holocaust Claims Office in the New York Department of Financial Services, ably led by Anna Cohen. And that helps survivors and families anywhere navigate through all of these different programs. The US Congress has become more engaged in Holocaust related issues. In 2016, they passed an act called the HERE Act, which established a federal statute of limitations to recover artwork, and to blunt the efforts that were being made by US museums to use the statute of limitations to block claims to recover looted art. In 2018, the Congress passed the Just Act requiring the State Department to publish what 46 countries have done in implementing the 2009 Theresen Declaration I negotiated and the Clinton administration. And now today in the Trump administration, literally, I have the booklet right here. We're going to be publishing before long our report. I'm expert advisor to the State Department of Holocaust Issues on what they've done. 
So what remains to be accomplished? And here I'll close. We've done a lot, but not enough. We cannot be satisfied when today over 90% of Holocaust survivors in the former Soviet Union live in poverty. Over 32% in Israel, in the Jewish state, of Holocaust survivors live in poverty. And in our United States, 33%, mostly those from the former Soviet Union. In New York City alone, a recent survey by the New York Federation found that around 40% of the 40,000 survivors in New York are at or near the poverty line. This is unacceptable for people who suffered so greatly when they were young. We must do the following. As much as we've increased these monthly pensions in our negotiations with the Germans, we need to increase them still more. On home care, with all the money we've got, 520 million euros, we still have a waiting list of people who are eligible under the program, but there's not enough money for them to get it. And we need to increase the number of hours beyond 50 hours per week for those who need it. We've had the fight for years in these negotiations with Germany to get coverage for what are called open ghettos in Eastern Europe, particularly Romania and North Africa, where Jews had to wear a Jewish star, where they could go out but had to come back and were held by prisoners. We've begun to get that, but it's like pulling teeth. It's also time for the European Union, where I was ambassador, to come off the sidelines where they've been for decades and become engaged in getting their member states in Europe to provide more in the way of benefits for their survivors. Now, I'm going to say something that will surprise you. The two countries which have done the most to help their survivors are Poland and Austria. They have established model pension programs which I think other European Union countries should emulate. And what they do in Austria and, and Poland, they will pay any survivor who was in their country during part of the war, wherever they live now, the same monthly pension they give to their old age pensioners, like our social security. This is really important and other European Union countries should do it. Property restitution is lagging in Poland and Hungary and Romania and Latvia and Lithuania and Croatia. And let me close with Holocaust education. I talked about how in January of 2000, working with Swedish Prime Minister Persson, we created the Holocaust Education Task Force and now the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance. Survivors are dying at the rate of 6% a year. We have to face the cold reality that before long there will be few eyewitnesses to tell the world about the Holocaust. And this at a time of rising anti-Semitism and Holocaust denial or ignorance. What do I mean by ignorance? I'll tell you what I mean. A recent survey done by the Claims Conference, I mean recent, just to cut last couple of months, over 40% of the millennial delegate uh, generation couldn't identify what Auschwitz was. Can you imagine? And over 20% say they never heard of the Holocaust. Now the Jewish Claims Conference has been the major funder for 20 years of Jewish education and remembrance about the Holocaust, using money from unclaimed Jewish properties in the former East Germany, as much as $18 million a year in things like March of the Living and, and other programs. But now the runoff from those properties has basically ended. And now we're down to just a few million dollars of Holocaust education. And so we are now negotiating, this will be part of our next round of negotiations with Germany not just for more home care, not just for more pensions, not just for more hardship payments, but we want the German government to begin to assume worldwide 
Holocaust education. They've done a great job inside Germany, but we think they have an obligation to finish the work even after survivors are gone by making sure Holocaust education continues worldwide. We're negotiating the details now. In principle, the German government seems to be uh, in agreement, but we're not there yet. And I hope in our next negotiation that we will conclude the details of this program. So that's why I say much has been done, but much remains to be done. And thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to talk to you. And I look forward to taking your questions. Ambassador Eisenstadt, that was one of the most amazing overviews I've ever heard of a topic that I've been following carefully for close to 20 years. Um, let me go through some of the questions and, and to anybody in the audience, I couldn't recommend enough, it's not going to appear very well on the screen, that if anybody's interested in the topic, you do indeed read his book, Imperfect Justice. Yes, I'm proud to have uh, my copy read, here. <laughs> Well, mine, mine's a paperback, so it's less elegant to look at. But let me, let me go to one question, which will then bring me into a question that I have of my own. Um, and then we'll go through some of the other questions that have come in while you were talking. What is the status of restitution of Polish properties, once owned by Jews prior to World War II and subsequently nationalized by the Polish communist government? And let me extend on that question, expand on it by asking you, to say a few words about this whole field of Eastern Europe, what still should be done there? Okay, so of all the issues that I've dealt with, the one that's been the most frustrating has been the issue of private property restitution in Poland. Now, mind you, let's be fair, Poland has, as a result of negotiations that I've been involved with, done a considerable amount in returning communal property, synagogues and cemeteries, for example, to the Jewish communities. They wanted to stop that too several years ago and we got them to continue. That is continuing. It needs to be accelerated. It's taken too long, too contentious about which synagogue should qualify, what's a synagogue and so forth. That's very important. It's the private property area that's the most confounding. Something like 40% of pre-war Warsaw in terms of businesses, factories, homes were owned by Jews. And they have gotten zero. Now, it's also true that largely non-Jews in Poland, and Pol Poland lost 3 million non-Jewish Poles, as well as 3.5 million Polish Jews, have likewise gotten nothing from the nationalization that the communists put in double. So they weren't double victims as much as the uh, as much as Jews, although some were. And President Kwasniewski, during the Clinton administration, with whom I very closely worked, drafted and sent to the Polish Parliament an excellent restitution bill, which would have allowed not the physical property coming back, because that's the old saying, oh, the Jews are going to come back and take my part. No, we know that you can't do that. We're talking about compensation. And what that bill would have done is allowed about 10% of, or 15% of the fair market value to be compensated. It went to the parliament, and the parliament put in a sort of killer amendment that said it's only available to those Jews who live in Poland. And of course that excluded everyone. So we're continuing to work on this in the Obama administration, the Clinton administration, and the Trump administration. It's a very sensitive issue, uh, but we think that if it's couched in the right way, this is not just for Jews, it's for non-Jews as well, that it's not taking anybody's property, it's paying some compensation. Uh, we hope that something can be done, but it's a very, very, very difficult issue. And again, I've been working on it unsuccessfully for uh, more than 20 years. With respect to Central and Eastern Europe, uh, the picture is very spotty. 
uh, we have been able through the claims conference programs, as I mentioned, with home care, with pensions, they're now fully covered, equally covered for those living in the West, uh, but they've done very little for their own survivors. This is all our negotiations with German money. Uh, and I would love to have them emulate what Poland and Austria have done in terms of pensions. Uh, they should do more on social services, uh, but it's very, and they should certainly do more on property restitution. Lithuania set a very good example. In 2011, I negotiated a $13 million agreement with, for over 10 years uh, for Lithuania. Uh, and uh, this, again, is a good model that can be used in Central and Eastern Europe. And the European Union should set it as a condition of countries who want to join, like Croatia, of saying, not unless you come to terms with this. And one of the reasons that I mentioned the European Union, not only because I was ambassador, but I lived there for two and a half, three years, and that is that these countries in Central and Eastern Europe, Deborah, are their member states. It shouldn't be just on the United States government to make the case. They should be making the case as a matter of justice is a matter of the founding principles of the European Union. Let me take you to a different aspect of something that you've talked about. One person on the, in, in the audience says, does Ambassador Eisenstadt have any knowledge of valuable stamp collections that were stolen during the war? And if so, whether any of these collections have been restituted? or if there are outstanding claims to recover these collections. It's a different aspect of the whole issue of, of looted art. Yes, uh, so stamps are considered part of the cultural property that is part of the Washington principle. And in Berlin in November of 2018, when we pointed out that the German museum have done very little to restitute, even though they, they've begun. Uh, they had a claims process, only 15 cases were resolved. And I signed on behalf of the US government in 2018 uh, with Monica Gruders, the Minister of uh, Art and uh, Media uh, in Germany, a joint declaration in which she's now getting additional money to fund provenance research for German museums. And they have found now hundreds, indeed thousands of books and stamps and other uh, memorabilia in some of their museums. So uh, this certainly is part of the entire process that we've, uh, that we've used. On the other hand, in art in general, while the US has done a good job. About 130 paintings have been restituted in, in uh, US museums. They began to use these affirmative defenses to block cases, which is what Congress did. Christie's and Sotheby's have done terrific work, and this would include stamps as well, by the way. Uh, any artwork, any cultural property, they have full time staffs uh, in. Uh, in Christie's and Sotheby's, and they screen every single artwork or cultural piece being sent to them or consigned to them for sale or auction to see if they have suspicious or origin. And Christie's alone has settled well over a hundred cases where it found, in fact, that these were looted by the Nazis. That hasn't happened in Europe. None of the art dealers have done that in Europe. Many of the countries, Spain, Portugal, have done zero in terms of restitution, no provenance research. And even in the Netherlands, which made a great start with Holocaust art restitution and research, they've recently instituted something they call the Balancing Act. What does that mean? If a claimant, a family, says, we believe that you are holding Nazi looted art that belongs to us, and we go before the Dutch tribunal, and there is a special tribunal. They've recently instituted what they call the balancing act factor. What does that mean? 
if a museum makes the case to the Dutch tribunal that they have a greater interest in keeping the art than the claimant has in recovering, they can keep the art. It's totally contrary to the whole spirit of the Washington principles. The UK has done a very good job. The French, and I spoke there uh, in 2019, November 2019, have really gotten their act together. They've put a new office, CIVS office, in the prime minister's office. They're looking at all their so-called MNR collection of art that was stolen by the Nazis and then returned after the war that's in the Louvre and the Jus de Pomme. Uh, and they're making a very sincere effort to do so. So there, there are areas of progress, but here again, uh, it's, it takes a lot of pushing by the US government. And again, where's the European Union? Another question from an entirely different angle, and I'm going to pass the microphone over to one of the listeners, somebody by the name of Jeremy, who wants to ask his question himself. Natasha, Ambassador, are we connecting yes. Jeremy into the... Yes, Ambassador Eisenstadt, um, thank you so much for your words and all of your efforts. I think you can be very proud of the 25-year-old of the version of, of yourself. Um, in the context of the Free Soviet Jewry Movement, we know um, that you played a very significant role, both personally and on the diplomatic front, for the modern day exodus that led to literally millions of Russian speaking Jews leaving the former Soviet Union. And we're wondering if you could share uh, one or two stories about those efforts of yours in the 1970s and the 1980s that led to this modern day exodus. Thank you very much, Jeremy. It's a, it's a privilege to do so. Uh, first, uh, we were able to get, uh, during the Carter administration, the president was very much engaged in this, and I certainly was, in doubling the number of Soviet Jews who uh, were allowed to emigrate from 25 to 50,000. That figure tended to stall when the Soviets invaded Afghanistan, but we more than doubled it. And if you want a personal story, I'll give you a personal story. Uh, Avital Sharansky, newly married to then Anatoly, now Natan, came initially with my former Harvard Law School professor, Alan Dershowitz, and then she came repeatedly on her own to plead that we make a statement that her husband, Anatoly Natan, was not a US spy. He was being charged with a US, being a US spy. And I went to President Carter and it's almost never done that an American president will say when any country happens to seize someone it's alleged to be a spy that he isn't or she isn't. Because then if the next person is seized and is and you say nothing, it speaks volumes. In this case, as a result of Avital's strong intervention, and may I say my support, the president, in the midst of the trial that Natan was going through, said he is not a US spy. This is totally false. And you don't have to believe me. You can read Natan's own memoirs. He said, in his opinion, that saved his life. Changing direction completely. Um, somebody else says, because they want to be involved in it afterwards, which US states do and which do not have legislation on Holocaust education? And what can concerned individuals do to rectify the situation even further? Well, that's a great question. I mean, New York, New Jersey, Florida, most recently, Oregon have it, California, but 38 states don't. And I'll be glad to supply to you a list of those states that do and those that don't. Uh, and one of the things you certainly could do is in the states that you live in that don't have it, you can become an advocate for doing it. Congress just passed a law that the president's gonna sign within the next week or so on Holocaust education are encouraging states to do this. So you could be very, very helpful here. Uh, also, I'm very much involved, I'm the chairman 
of the foundation called Defiant Requiem Foundation. And what we have done is also part of Holos Cross Education. We have put on over 50 concerts, uh, twice in Lincoln Center, once in Carnegie Hall, in Chicago, in Los Angeles, in 50 places all over the world to raise money for Holocaust survivors. And the defiant requiem Verdi at Theresen honors a Jewish prisoner course that remarkably was created in the midst of the Theresenstadt concentration camp with a young Jewish composer, Raphael Schechter, who, who had taken in a copy of Verdi's Requiem after 12, 14 hours of slave labor got these Jewish prisoners to learn the Requiem, uh, performed it on 16 occasions. The last was June of 40, 1944, when the SS brought the International Red Cross to give a blessing that Theresienstadt was a model place. They cleaned the camp up. They shipped all the kids and all the elderly out. They gave them a, a, a short guided tour. They put in swings. They gave the kids candies, all of which was, of course, a phony. We actually have film footage of that that we include as part of our uh, requiem. We found surviving members of the course. It's very powerful. And we've now developed new educational material, including an edited version of an Emmy-nominated film about all this for use by schoolrooms. So one of the things, and I really would urge you, this would be a wonderful project, Matthew, and I am for Lemud to be involved with. Even for the 12 states that have Holocaust education, they don't know how to teach it to middle and high school kids. They're afraid that, you know, with showing the bodies and so forth, it'll scare kids away. What we've tried to do in the Defiant Requiem is provide a model of inspiration, how music and the arts and culture gave people hope in a hopeless situation. So one of the things that I would love to have you engaged in is to work with us, not just on the 38 states that don't have any Holocaust education, but on developing models for how teachers should teach it. At best, they may get one or two days to talk about World War II, let alone the Holocaust. We've got to give them things that are compelling, that are visual, and that really help kids understand it. Um, one other thing that I'll say on, on this, the Shoah Foundation, Steve Smith is the head, of course, it's a, a, very a very famous foundation from the producer of Schindler's List, Steven Spielberg, has now developed a holographic uh, of a real survivor. And through our official intelligence, and I've used this, I did it at the World Economic Forum in Davos, I've done it in Los Angeles and Houston, at the Holocaust Museums, you can actually have a young person talk to that survivor and the holographic image of a real person answers immediately. We need those kinds of creative things at a time again when the Holocaust is not remembered, not known, uh, is ignored, uh, and at a time of rising anti-Semitism. It's terribly important. Questions are coming in quicker than I believe you still have time to answer them. Let's try and get through one or two more. Um, the whole question of mass graves in Eastern Europe, yes. where there's buried more than 100, more than 1.5 million largely unnamed victims. Where does all that fit into? Okay, so, so this is, uh, th there is a Catholic priest, Father Benoit, who has done the Lord's work, he uncovered hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of mass graves in Ukraine. He's got a foundation based in, uh, in Washington. He's continuing that. I met him. He's talked at our Defiant Requiem Foundation uh, events. He's trying to expand that. My own relatives in Lithuania I found out when I was ambassador to the European Union in the beginning, Matthew, to do this Holocaust work because of your dad. And I went to Lithuania to start doing property restitution. And I knew my family came from there. The Lithuania has fantastic archives. And we hired someone, my late wife, Fran, and I hired someone to research it. 
And we found that three grand nieces of mine, that is my grandfather's sisters, had never been able to escape. We looked at Yad Vashem, we looked at every record you could get, no record. Why? Because the Jews in Lithuania were not taken to concentration camps by and large. They were shot and put into mass graves. And so Father Benoit has done really remarkable work. Here again, he shouldn't have to do it on his own shoulders. It's something the European Union should help fund. It's something that these countries should help fund in Ukraine, in Poland. Uh, so there has been progress, but much more remains to be done. And with modern techniques in terms of uh, DNA and uh, tracking, uh, we can identify where these mass graves are located and have suitable memorials mentioning the history of that. I can't thank you enough, Ambassador Eisenstadt, for the most fascinating hour that you've just been giving us. Lots more questions, unfortunately, no more time to answer them. So I'm going to pass the microphone back to Matthew to try somehow and sum this all up. <laughs> well, thank you, Deborah. Thank you for your service today as well. Uh, Ambassador, I just sat really, thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, we at Lemud FSU really do uh, focus on Holocaust education as part of our events, uh, which of course is to engage Russian speaking Jews throughout the world in Judaism and it's keeping that spark alive that is, that is our mission. And uh, of course we work with claims conference as well, as we mentioned on, on these Holocaust knowledge studies. Uh, much, much work is yet to be done. We will be glad to discuss how the, all the organizations from Defining uh, Requiem and Claims and Limud FSU can enhance Jewish education, Holocaust education in the United States. That is critically important. Um, so I know time is running short. You've got another obligation. Really, uh, we want to thank everybody for joining uh, this Limud FSU call. Uh, I think it was a fascinating, as Deborah said, a fascinating, fascinating hour. Um, and again, thank you, Ambassador Eisenstadt. We look forward to more interactions between you, the claims, and Limud FSU uh, over the ensuing years. So thank you. Well, very thank much. you. I'll try to give you a list of states, first of all. Uh, and Chaim and Matthew. And Deborah, I'm more than happy uh, if we want to reschedule this and take more questions or have a more interactive session based sure. on what I've said. Sure, I'm sure. at your, I'm that at your great. disposal. That's great. Really Thank you very really. much. Thank I you. I would like to add only information about next week. Maybe, uh, Mr. Ambassador, you want to hear our next guest next Sunday is the chief uh, rabbi of uh, Russia, speaking about the corona in Russia, speaking about Shavuot speaking about other uh, exciting events. So well, next I, know, Sunday, I know him very well. I see him in Davos every year at the Shabbat we've organized at the World Economic Forum. And believe it or not, we started with uh, almost nobody. We have over 220 people who participate in the World Economic Forum's uh, Shabbat. And I get uh, from uh, the chief rabbi of Russia, he comes. And uh, he sent me a special uh, uh, matzahs for uh, Passover every year. <laughs> So this is so we'll, Sunday. We'll send you an invite, yeah. This is May Sunday. 24th. This is Sunday and next Wednesday in this current forum, which uh, Matthew is uh, hosting. Our next guest will be the chairman of the national uh, important organization of uh, United States jury, Malcolm Online, which tell us how North American jury living under Corona. So first of all, we'll hear about Russia, and a few days later, we'll hear about America. Thank you very much. We will get all the information. And once again, thank Matthew, thank Debbie, thank uh, Natasha, thank Sandra Khan, which helped us to organize. And I want to mention Mr. Ambassador, although it's scheduled time, Greg Schneider and Arya Buchheister and many other of the Clems Conference staff were present at this uh, event. Well, I have to tell you, Greg and Ari and Karen Heilig are real champions. I mean, uh, I get the sort of layups when it comes to doing the German negotiations. In between our annual sessions, it's Greg and Karen uh, and our terrific staff, Rudy and in, uh, in Berlin, who really do the heavy lifting. Thank you very much, and thank you, Diane Wall. Thank you, everybody.
thank you everyone bye -bye. and you can what? find the recording of this thank session you. on our facebook page so please go to Limud FSU official on our Facebook page and you will find the session recorded right from the beginning. And as Chaim told you, please join us uh, this Sunday, May 24th, uh, on a special session with the Rabbi Beryl Lazar, the Chief Rabbi of Russia. Thank you so and much. Can everyone. I just Thank say, you. yes. Can I say one thing? My name is Patty Kenner. I'm a friend of Stu Eisenstadt's. I just got off the phone because Carolyn Maloney, my congresswoman who worked 18 years on this bill for Holocaust education, I told her that someone asked the question how to help. And she said, everyone should write to the president and say, this should be a signing, a special legislative signing, and all the major Jewish leaders should be invited while this bill is signed that the president's going to sign for Holocaust education. Thanks. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Patricia. Thank you. Shalom, Thank you. Bye. Take care. Stay Thank home. You, Shalom. Shalom.